Only in America. 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 Hi there, I'm Ali Nirani, and welcome to Only in America. This week, I talked to Laura Pena of the Texas Civil Rights Project. Laura's perspective from the inside of Immigration and Customs Enforcement made for a personal and a professional challenge. How I navigated that personally was by answering the phone call when a lawyer would call me, by returning phone calls, by providing documentation when requested, and, you know, I hope for the lawyers who were on the other side that they saw that. And of all things, I was a guest on Fox and Friends, where I chatted with Steve Ducey for a few minutes about border security, the government shutdown, and what lies ahead in the nation's immigration debate. You know what? Putting up a big wall, that doesn't really help them from a security perspective right. or from a trade perspective. So we think that if we're going to secure our border, let's put money at ports of entry. That's where drugs are being smuggled. Right. That's where the security threats are. From the National Immigration Forum, I'm Mali Nirani with Only in America. Laura Pena grew up in Harlingen, Texas, along the U.S.-Mexico border in the Rio Grande Valley. As a child, she remembers the border as a place in between neither Mexico nor the United States. Those days, walking into Mexico was an everyday ritual, whether it was for a dentist's appointment or a veterinarian visit. After graduating from Wellesley College, Laura caught the campaign bug. She worked for John Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign and, more recently, Hillary Clinton's campaign for president. Then, Laura went to law school and, of all things, got a job as an attorney with Immigration and Customs Enforcement under President Obama. As a mentor of hers told her, we need people of your mindset on the government side. So the reason I thought this conversation was so important, because as people who care about immigrants and immigration, there are a select few of us who have had experience on the inside. Laura's story of growing up on the border to then going on and working to enforce our nation's immigration laws is a window into the challenges and, yes, the importance of smart and dedicated people carrying out the mission of our government. We may not always agree with what they do, but I think we have a lot to learn from their experience. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Laura, thank you very, very much for joining today. Happy to be here. So before we jump into the issues, you grew up in Harlingen, Texas. Tell me about that. I did. I was actually born in McAllen and raised in Harlingen, Texas. It's a small border town. About 60,000 people live in Harlingen. And I had a great childhood. We lived on about 10 acres of land and had a horse. Her name was Paloma. We had several dogs. I loved my childhood. I was very fortunate to grow up in a loving home and in a home where my parents always encouraged education. So when I graduated high school, I did uh, leave for Boston, Massachusetts, which was really, really far away from my family. I had never been east of the Mississippi, but I... And just a little bit colder than the Rio Grande Valley. Just a little bit, just a little bit. I, I didn't know that at the time. Really? Uh, I didn't know my... <laughs> I, I knew I wanted to go to college. I didn't know where, but you know, my mom purchased the U.S. News 500 top colleges in the nation in these little two sentence descriptions. And I bored through the entire thing. And at the end, there was an alphabetical order. At the end, there was Wellesley College, and I just read that you know alumni Hillary Clinton, Madeleine Albright, Madam Chiang Kai Shek had all graduated from there. And I, I read that, and I said, okay, those are the classrooms I need to be trained in. So I went to Wellesley College. So before we get even past Wellesley, how do you kind of summarize what was like to grow up on the U.S.-Mexico border? Well, there is the border then when I was growing up and there's the border now. The border then when I was growing up, it really wasn't even a border. I like to call it the place in between. It was neither Mexico nor was it the United States. You know, the Rio Grande Valley is separated by the King Ranch. So you have the Rio Grande Valley, and to get north, at least from Harlingen, you have to take Highway 77, and there's literally a sign that says no gas station for 60 miles. 
And so we were physically separated from the rest of Texas. And quite often we had our day to days were on the other side of the border. You know, my dentist was there, good veterinarians uh, were on the other side of the border. So it was very fluid. I didn't really have a great distinction of what the border was until I left, to be honest. And at what point when you were kind of seeing the border from afar, did you realize that, yeah, things were changing? Well, I think things started to change probably post-NAFTA when we started to have an influx of outsiders, some businesses, folks from, you know, who weren't from Texas. So I started to learn a little more in high school about the border that was existing. And then after I left, I realized that there was this conception that the border was sort of a dangerous foreign place when I just knew it as home. So you graduate from Mosley, and what leads you to decide, okay, I want to become an attorney? I had always known I would become a lawyer. My father's a lawyer. He and my mother are first-generation college graduates, first-generation Mexican-Americans. And so I, I knew I would want to follow in his footsteps. So I had applied to law schools uh, shortly after graduating college, but I took some time to live and work in Washington, D.C. I worked for the Democratic National Committee, and I was focused on encouraging women candidates to run for office. And then I did actually the first uh, bilingual women's outreach program for the 2004 presidential election when John Kerry was running. And so I helped execute a bilingual campaign to encourage women voters for John Kerry. And then you decided you were going to go back to law school. And then I decided I was going to go back to law school. I started law school, and then I was very quickly encouraged by my mentor and former boss, Ann Lewis, to join Hillary Clinton's campaign. So, you know, I had an organizing bug early. So when I say dropped out of law school for a couple of years, and I organized uh, on Hillary Clinton's 2008 presidential campaign, I ended up running the Latino Outreach Program, which was a fantastic experience. It took me all over the country, even organizing in Puerto Rico. And so when that ended, she asked me to stay on with her to start a nonprofit organization, which is where we thought we were headed before she was asked to be Secretary of State. And I agreed so long as I fulfilled my own promise to myself to finish law school by the age of 30. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing uh, the evening program at Georgetown Law uh, while working full-time at the State Department. So then, as if that part of your career was interesting enough, you get your law degree, and then where of all places do you decide to practice law? Well, it was really about how do I want to practice law, mm. not necessarily mm -hmm. where. In D.C., even though I love doing policy work, after almost a decade at that point of being in Washington, I knew I needed to get out and get into a courtroom. And so there really is no better way to start that path than by clerking for a federal judge. And so I left Washington for San Diego, California, and I clerked for a federal district judge, uh, Gonzalo Curiel. He later came to be the infamous judge that uh, Donald Trump accused of being biased because of his Mexican heritage. But I just knew him as judge at the time, and he's a fantastic human being, and it was great to learn uh, the law from him. And that's when I knew, okay, I really like the law, I want to practice the law, and I need to get into a courtroom. Mm -hmm. And from there? From there, I was in California, and oddly, they really don't give a crap about Washington, D.C. experience. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I was applying to law firms and I was public defenders and uh -huh. I just anything that would get me into a courtroom. And that's when uh, the Department of Homeland Security had lifted its hiring freeze and they were looking for trial attorneys for immigration and customs enforcement. And I was really torn before applying. I reached out to another, I'm very fortunate to have so many mentors in my life, uh, Marisol Perez. Uh, she's formerly MALDEF. She's a fantastic immigration mm -hmm. lawyer in San Antonio. And I said, Marisol, I need a job. What do you think about immigration law? I said, hiring, this sounds crazy to me, but what do you think? And she said, Laura, under this president, I think it's a good thing. And we need people of your mindset on the government side. There's an incredible amount of power. So I applied and they offered me a job in their Los Angeles office. And I was a trial attorney with ICE for two years. Shortly after I started, President Obama issued his executive actions on immigration reform. So it gave me a great amount of authority to determine how to prosecute cases 
or to maybe better frame it, to not prosecute cases and really prioritize particular individuals for removal and not focus on those who are not presenting a threat to our society. So that was great. I was able to exercise my discretion in a lot of cases, impact a lot of people's lives in that capacity. That being said, I still had to deport people. And it was, you know, putting yourself in a job that you know you're going to struggle with, or you do have to enforce the law. It was a learning experience. And, you know, I did the best that I could. And I learned very quickly that the system is quite messed up. And so I tried to be, you know, a, a fair counterpart in immigration proceedings, particularly when most individuals don't have lawyers. Right. So it would be me and the judge and what they're, they're called respondents in immigration proceedings, you know, a mom with four kids or whatever. And she doesn't know what's going on. And so to me, it was about this is an administrative hearing. This is not a criminal hearing, right? This is an administrative hearing. And what we're trying to figure out here among the three of us, the respondent, the judge, and myself, is whether relief is available. And if it is, the government should not be fighting and posing barriers if there's viable relief available for the individual. So that's how I approached the work. But ultimately, at the end of the day, there are individuals who did not have relief available and who were priorities under the Obama administration. And so I would have to pursue those cases. And, and that was that was tough. So as a public servant, as an attorney in the courtroom, you're making real life decisions. And those of us on the outside, you know, sometimes we forget there's a tremendous amount of responsibility and accountability that comes with that authority. And it's just very easy for those of us on the outside just to be angry. So when you were on the inside, if you will, and you saw kind of what advocates were saying and doing, how did you kind of separate your professional role as enforcing the law and your experience growing up in Harlingen, for example? Did you find yourself grappling with that? Oh, absolutely. I sort of didn't come out of the closet with some people in my life, meaning I didn't tell them where I was working because you know, I was in a way just nervous about how they would perceive me. But it was less of family and more of the advocates, more of my professional network. Family on the border, you know, families are complicated. I mean, I have family members who support Donald Trump. But for the, my professional community, I was, I was concerned because I had been engaged with the Latino community. And there was definitely, for some people I talked to, a sense that I had become a traitor. And how I navigated that personally was by answering the phone call when a lawyer would call me, by returning phone calls, by providing documentation when requested, by helping facilitate the movement of a case, and by not fighting tooth and nail ridiculous issues like change of venue or administrative issues that some of my colleagues, because they're so entrenched in the systems, my colleagues at the time, they really took a very adversarial position. So what I tried to do to sort of justify it in my own mind, was to be a collegial, respectful, thoughtful government attorney. And I hope for the lawyers who were on the other side that they saw that. So the Trump administration comes into being, mm -hmm. and you're still in this role. How did their changes, their policy changes, how do they start to impact what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and what you enjoyed about your job at the time? Well, I'll clarify that. I left ICE just before the 2016 presidential election. And I left because twofold. One, I was hoping my old boss, Hillary, would win. And if she did, uh, that I could help, you know, bring my observations from the field to the White House and implement policy changes as part of the administration. That was my hope. But I also knew that there was a chance that Donald Trump would be elected. And if he was, that I would want to be nowhere near ICE. And so unfortunately, the latter happened. Uh, and mm -hmm. when that happened, I was working for a business immigration law firm in Silicon Valley. And I was practicing business immigration law. And the election of Donald Trump immediately hit immigration practitioners, even in the business context with the Muslim ban. There are people, particularly in the Bay Area, we have a huge number of H-1B visa holders who were affected by these proclamations. There's a real sense of fear. I was able to see very up close and personal how those decisions, how those policies were impacting really the psyche of the communities uh, that live here. And then so the summer, last summer, you decided to return to Texas. I did. 
I was still working with the business immigration law firm. And when I was with ICE, I remember in 2014, the border search had happened. And I was quite upset that this humanitarian crisis was happening at our borders. I wasn't at home trying to address the humanitarian crisis from another side, but the Rio Grande Valley in 2014 was sort of ground zero. And then so fast forward 2018, once again, the Rio Grande Valley is ground zero for a crisis that's being manufactured by our own government. And I was just so furious about the blatant, blatant violation of international law, our own federal laws, and obviously really concerned about the families. So I quit my job and I reached out to organizations who are working in this space to offer my time. And I learned of the work the Texas Civil Rights Project was doing. And I found the lead attorney and I said, what is it that you need? I speak Spanish. I'm an immigration lawyer. How can I help? And and he said, you literally just came down from heaven. We need a visiting attorney to help us handle mm-hmm. this crisis. So that's when I joined the organization in July of this year. So where are we now with the ongoing crisis that is the child separation disaster that the administration created? So I'll take that a, a couple of different ways. You have the litigation, the ACLU brought this big case in San Diego and the judge ordered the administration to reunify all the families. And not all families have been reunified for a variety of different reasons. Some of those families, which are our clients, the parents are still detained. And in some cases, the children are with a sponsor. It could be a family member. In other cases, the children are still also uh, in government shelters. And the reason varies. Some is a little complicated. Um, In the Miss L litigation, didn't include legal guardians. So we have some mothers who are legal guardians who are not getting protections of the class membership in that litigation. Some parents have criminal history, which have deemed them ineligible. So we work through these cases slowly but surely to try and push for reunification. And in some instances, reunification may not happen. And it's heartbreaking, but that is the reality. So we do our best to advocate for our clients for reunification. And when it's not feasible, then the parent may go back. Otherwise, it's about trying to figure out how to get the parent and child sent back to the country from which they fled together, which is also quite challenging to coordinate with the government. So we have Texas Civil Rights Project. We represent almost 400 parents who were separated from their children. And so it's a matter of making sure that we're available to all of those parents who want assistance. And we work with several large law firms who provide pro bono representation as well. And in some instances, we'll do direct representation, but it's it's still ongoing. I would also say that family separations still happen. We still monitor the federal courthouse in McAllen. Every morning and afternoon, under zero tolerance, migrants are being criminally prosecuted for seeking protection. And so we appear at the invitation of the federal public defenders, and we ask, have you been separated from a child? And we still have parents who raise their hands. And so we uh, take those cases on. We pursue them aggressively. And it's a variety of different reasons why the government will do that separation. But many times when we run it down, that reason is insufficient. And so reunification happens in the end. So that's what we push for. So we're talking it after the administration's, quote, asylum ban has been temporarily halted. So let's say, just for the sake of the conversation, that that asylum ban was to go into effect. Would that also then lead to another round of family separations? It could. It could. And the administration has indicated its plans to reinstitute what I call false choice family separation, meaning that they will detain families for 20 days to comply with the Flores Settlement Agreement. And then they'll force the parent to decide, do you want your kid in detention with you long term while you pursue your case? Or do you want to turn your child over to government custody, maybe to be released to a sponsor. But we know that that's increasingly slow process. So I think that those are the plans that the government has stated. So I think that would happen if there's an asylum ban. You know, I think the cases are still going to take a long time because if somebody's afraid to go back to their home country, they're still be eligible to apply for withholding of removal or convention against torture, which actually have higher burdens. They're higher bars. So you have harder to get that relief than it is asylum. 
Um, but the process takes just as long. So the administration's argument that they're trying to you know, facilitate orderly processing of asylum seekers by pushing them to ports of entry is, is just ridiculous. I mean, it's the same process to apply for right. asylum as it is to provide for these other forms of relief. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about immigration judges, because you know, the administration will say, well, we need more immigration judges. You know, as advocates, sometimes we're saying the same thing, but you know, our version of an immigration judge is not exactly their version of an immigration judge. Having been on kind of both tables in an immigration court, can you unpack what's the role of an immigration judge and how should they be able to make their decisions versus at this point, how are they required to? Immigration law is administrative law. So it's an administrative legal officer, the immigration judge. And the role is supposed to be to make sure that the rules, the laws are, are abided by and that the process runs smoothly. And that any relief available, so let's say it's asylum, that judge is the fact finder and is able to make sure that the applicant, the respondent can testify to his or her experience in their home country, determine the credibility of that person. That's another role of the judge, very important role, and then decide whether or not the individual is eligible for that relief. That is the role of the immigration judge. Unfortunately, in many instances, because the Executive Office for Immigration Review, EOIR, which is the entity that's part of the Department of Justice, the immigration judges ultimately report up to the Attorney General. Whoever the Attorney General is greatly influence the amount of authority and the tenor of the immigration judges. So under formerly Jeff Sessions, immigration judges really had their hands tied in a lot of different ways by various rulings that the attorney general was making. And he was also creating a very hostile environment for the respondents, for applicants. So what do you think the next two years hold for all of us who care about these issues? I mean, just hold on to your seats. If anything, we know it's a roller coaster ride. With this asylum ban, Judge Tiger granted the ACLU's request for a temporary restraining order. Hopefully that will turn into a permanent injunction. We could see this asylum ban go up to the Supreme Court very quickly. So I think we need to be prepared. And what's interesting is this asylum ban hasn't gotten as much press. Right. There's not a whole lot of media attention on it, but it is a really severe, severe rule. It's a regulation that the government proposed before the president signed the proclamation. And it is completely discriminatory, even though it doesn't say country of origin, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. It is precisely intended to prevent brown people from entering our country and seeking relief under the law. And so I think what we need to be doing is trying to find ways to pull it at the heartstrings of the American public, which that happened during the family separation crisis. You know, you remember the recording of the child just right. crying, mama, mama, papa. When you hear a baby cry, there's no, you don't think of a particular skin tone, right? That's just a baby crying. And so I think our challenge is how do we bring that sort of empathy nationally to this conversation on all of these issues, which are going to continue to be a fierce, fierce battle, particularly as uh, the president is appointing you know, White House insiders throughout the Department of Justice. Yeah, and that's the big struggle. How do you help people understand the impact of the asylum ban, for example? without the sounds and the images that we saw mm -hmm. with the family separation crisis. I think that's a really good point, Ali. At yesterday's hearing uh, in front of Judge Tiger, the ACLU was talking about children in Tijuana. Some members of the caravan are making their way to Tijuana. And at the ports of entry, you have unaccompanied children who have made this long journey, who the Mexican government is preventing from going across the border. And so, you know, you have these children with teddy bears, I'm hoping that these images get out, who are just trying to seek protection and safety. And if they cross illegally, these children are going to be banned from seeking asylum. It feels like we've got to, instead of just telling the story about what's happening on this side of the border, like you're saying, we've got to stretch our stories from Tijuana through Mexico all the way back to whether it's Honduras or otherwise. Because I think more Americans than we realize they see migration in a global context, but I'm not sure we as advocates are, are kind of telling the other side of the story from, say, a Fox News. Right, right. I think that's right. So what gives you hope moving forward? Well, that's a good question. I think, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, our clients, 
One of our clients, Vilma, I just talked to her last night. Uh, her husband was murdered in Guatemala. She and her son, Sergio, uh, were separated for over a month before being reunified. And they're living in Houston, Texas. And Vilma is strong and determined and hopeful for her son Sergio's future. So if, if Vilma can be strong and determined and hopeful, having gone what she's gone through, horrific trauma at the hands of our own government, then certainly I can have hope. And I do it for all of the Vilmas out there. So I have just two more questions for you. When you go back to Harlingen, does it still feel like the place in between, like you said earlier? It does. It does. And part of it is because of a, I would say maybe a mentality of uh, the people of the Rio Grande Valley. We're particularly proud of being from the Rio Grande Valley. And in a way, ni somos de aquí ni de allá. We're not from here nor there. We are from the Rio Grande Valley. And particularly because we had a thousand troops in our home area, helicopters circling our skies, military vehicles going through the little placita areas, SWAT teams performing exercises. We were being occupied, Ali. We still are. They may move some of the resources to California, but it's also in that terrifying space of feeling occupied. It was also this sort of feeling that we're not the United States, but we're not Mexico either. Mm -hmm. We're this in between. So the name of the podcast is Only in America. So my last question for you is to finish this sentence. Only in America, dot, dot, dot. Hmm. Only in America can a small town or a girl dream of attending the same college as former First Lady Hillary Clinton. And years later, after attending that college, dance at a salsa club in Cartagena on the margins of the summit of the Americas representing the United States government. That was a long sentence. That might be of a few sentences. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, thank you very, very much. That was awesome. I really appreciate it. Ali, it was a pleasure. Laura Pena is a visiting attorney with the Texas Civil Rights Project in Austin, Texas. There's more about Laura at our website, immigrationforum.org. And while you're there, consider subscribing to Only in America. Support for the National Immigration Forum comes from the James Irvine Foundation, expanding opportunity for the people of California, and from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, established in 1911 by Andrew Carnegie to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. As the partial federal government shutdown enters week four and 800,000 workers are about to miss their second paycheck, the crisis is growing. Over the Martin Luther King weekend, President Trump offered Democrats a compromise of sorts that includes $5.7 billion for a range of border and interior enforcement measures, along with temporary protections for some DACA and TPS recipients, along with a raft of problematic changes to asylum law and other measures. A big portion of the debate these days, obviously, revolves around the border wall. When asked about border security, this is what I told Fox and Friends Steve Ducey. You know, so we work with a lot of folks along the border, from law enforcement to mayors to business leaders, and they tell us, you know what, putting up a big wall, that doesn't really help them from a security perspective right. or from a trade perspective. So we think that if we're going to secure our border, let's put money at ports of entry. That's where drugs are being smuggled. Right. That's where the security threats are. So we think that, you know, we can figure out what's a wall, what's a fence, but let's focus on the ports of entry because that's where the threat is. Look, if there's anything we have learned over the last two years, it's that the majority of Americans want our national leaders to govern towards smart solutions, not bicker over sound bites that do absolutely nothing to solve problems. That's all for this edition of Only in America. The show is produced by Regina Medina, Emily Chow, and Joanna Taylor. Kathleen Farrell is the executive producer. Thanks for listening. I'm Ali Narani. Mm-hmm.